Okay, uh, welcome to the Variety Performance uh, and Research. Um, this is not the right slide. This is the industry perspective. Um, and so today we're going to hear from several representatives uh, from different companies or marketing seed in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I guess we'll just start with Jordan Varberg from Bayer. As Jim mentioned, I'm Jordan Varberg from Bayer Crop Science. Uh, work in the, our Invigor canola business. We're, uh, as Bayer, we're a spring canola company. And we focus on hybrids for the, mostly the Canadian prairies in the northern U.S. Uh, what I try to go through, I just want to go through is uh, just some of our breeding program, what we have in the pipeline, not so much varieties and what we have for sale. You can stop by our booth if you want to talk about hybrids and varieties. Uh, we have sheets and you can talk about yields and potentials and what, how they'll work on your farm. Uh, just a brief overview, just from our breeding, breeding operations, seed production, our Invigor 140P results, uh, and then a little bit about the future, and then questions if you have any. Uh, going back to our history on Invigor, uh, we're relatively new in the canola business. We didn't start until the, the mid-90s. We come with a, a system, our, our seed link system, which is Liberty Link canola, but it's linked to our hybrid system. So we used a Liberty gene as a marker gene for our male sterility and our male restorer genes. So we can pretty much make a hybrid out of any canola. Anything we can cross manually, we can produce in the production fields. And that was kind of the catch with how doing hybrid canola back in the 90s was being able to produce in the field. What would happen is if you have a CMS technology and using our Polima's uh, hybrid system, what would happen is it would get hot and then the hybrid system would break down and your, your females would start shedding pollen. Well, then you wouldn't end up with a, with a hybrid. So just a little bit on timeline. In 2012, we introduced club root resistance, and in 2013, we started with our new pod shatter lines with a, a new trait to reduce uh, pod shatter and pod drop in canola. Uh, just going into our breeding, from breeding to the farm, you know, it starts out as a concept in the breeding program. We were always evaluating early uh, exotic material, doing lots of plots in, uh, across the prairies in North Dakota. Uh, we go into development in the parent seed, hybrid seed, and then the sales. I kind of I work in between the hybrid seed production and the sales. I'm the link between breeding and commercial sales within the company. So uh, this our breeding breeding farm near uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. In our breeding program, our breeding and innovations, all of our main breeding is done in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. From there, we have plant breeding, molecular breeding. Uh, plant pathology, variety registration, our seed chemistry lab, our laboratory and greenhouse, uh, quality assurance. Uh, you know, the picture I had up of our breeding facility in Saskatchewan, that was before our recent addition. Uh, we invested $15 million into new greenhouses, uh, positive pressure, negative pressure rooms for our hybrid seed production. So we do our pre-basic seed in Saskatchewan, we can do it year round. Prior to that, before having negative and positive pressure rooms, we'd have to do it just when the canola wasn't pollinating in the field. But after we got our pressure, pressurized rooms, we could, we could do it year round. So we can do seed increases throughout the growing season. So uh, going on to the next slide would, would have been breeding trials. Uh, we're doing breeding trials all over the Canadian prairies. We have a fella in North Dakota that does five to 6,000 breeding tri trials or plots in North Dakota. He's uh, mostly for adaptation. So we're breeding Brassica napus spring lines. We're also breeding some Brassica juncea lines. Uh, we see juncea as a potential for the future, but it's really in its infancy right now. Uh, you know, our, our focus on our breeding program, of course, is yield. Yield drives everything in our business. You know, what's the farmer going to sell? He's going to sell yield. And then it's the quality parameters. All of the Invigor lines that we sell in the U.S. and in Canada go through the Canadian registration program. So they meet the qualifications for sale in Canada. Uh, if you don't know all canola grown in Canada, it has to go through the registration program to be recommended for growth in Canada. So we use those. We don't, we don't pull lines in that don't quite meet the specifications for Canada. Everything we sell meets that specification. Uh, next thing after yield is probably black leg tolerance. Uh, we've, you've heard black leg out here in the PNW, and I'm surprised you didn't see it sooner. Uh, we have black leg. We've had black leg for many years. 
Our breeding program is focused, and our, our plant pathologist is always looking at new resistance genes, multiple genes to put into our, our backgrounds and our breeding program, so we have the tolerance we need in the field. So if you're looking at a new Invigor line, those are the re most recently assigned uh, black leg rating products. They, they were tested in the last couple of years in the black leg trials, have their official certification of what black leg ratings they have. Uh, if you take a line that's probably 10 years old, as we have an older line that's called 5440, which is still a commercial line, grown in a lot of areas in, Can in uh, North Dakota, we're starting to see that one fail. Uh, it's you know, a lot of areas where it is failing, it's a, it's a two-year rotation. It's wheat, canola, wheat, canola, and snow mixed in there. So you're getting, we're getting the breakdown of that gene technology, and, and it's been in the rotation for eight years. It's been the same, same in vigor. We're trying to move guys into our newer products, different background in black leg resistance, and so they can be successful on their farm. The other thing would be is trying to get the guys to go with longer rotations. But it's hard to get them out of a two-year rotation in North Dakota. They look at, well, that's what I make money on. I make money on canola, I make money on wheat. So it's the, that's the mentality they have in the Cavalier County in North Dakota. So, uh, so black leg is, is probably our primary disease that we put the tolerance or resistance in our, our crops, our canola lines. Uh, the next one would be sclerotinia tolerance, and we actually launched a line that has a trait for scler sclerotinia tolerance in 2013, and then we come with a new line in 2014. Uh, it's multiple genes, it's a recessive trait. Uh, the one thing that's coming along with our, with our sclerotinia tolerance is that it's delaying maturity. It's European material, it's, delayed, it's a longer season canola, so we're kind of focused in areas where you can grow a longer season. Okay, two minutes. <laughs> Canola. So, anyways, uh, the next next thing on that would be our other research. We're looking at pod shatter tolerance, enhanced black leg traits, both uh, public and proprietary genes, uh, and then club root resistance. As I had a club root resistance trait that was introduced in 2012, uh, we're trying to further expand that. Uh, club roots become a disease that's in North Dakota now. It originally started out in Edmonton, and it's spread out from there, and it could devastate canola. If you ever seen club root in canola, go on the uh, Canola Council website, search, search uh, club root, you'll see lots of nice photos of club root. Uh, but with that, I'll get to my end. I had two minutes left, and I'm probably down to a minute. Uh, thank you for your business. If you're thinking about canola and spring canola, look at Invigors. Uh, they're all Liberty Link, different herbicide uh, mode of action for you to use. And uh, we'll talk to you later. If you want to stop by our booth, I'll be around most of today. Thank you. Okay, okay the, qu the question was, on black leg, and I say black leg is every place, and does that mean you guys are using a fungicide to spray for black leg? And the answer is probably no. They're looking at resistance genes within the crop. And you gotta you got remember there's two types, of, you got black leg, black leg incidence, and you have severity. Severity is when it goes into the pith and destroys your pith and cuts off your plant circulation. Severe, you know, incidence is just on the stem. If you have a stem canker, it doesn't move into the pith, you're okay. So there's a lot of incidences, but it doesn't always mean you're severe enough to cause injury or yield uh, loss to that crop. Even without fungicide application? Even without fungicide application. There's a few products that are registered. We actually have one called ProLine that's registered, but you know, I can count on one hand how many gallons we use for ProLine on Black Lake. That's uh, mostly a Sclartinia product. All righty. Well, good morning. I'm Bob Lashley with Winfield. I'm out of Pomeroy, Washington. Um, I showed this slide yesterday in the presentation I did. It's pretty awesome to come to a direct seed conference and show a good black fallow field and the dust is flowing in the wind. I know this isn't how uh, most of us are doing it anymore, but it's a, it's a nice Midwest picture. You find the advance. Uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about what we have available and, and uh, variety selection. Our Cropland Roundup Ready line, our lead horses, uh, you know, just stepping back, University of Idaho does a great job of testing the Pacific Northwest, you know, explicitly on the spring varieties. They've got more locations out there. It's a wealth of knowledge. Um, so, you know, hats off to them for all the work they do to put this out. Um, going through our lineup, and you can look at the, you know, as far as references go, as far as what might work on your farm, you can look at the U of I data, and, uh, and they've got a lot of locations here in the, in the Northwest, and, and see what fits your geography, what fits your type of rainfall. So that's one of the references. Second reference, at least for the cropland line, 
is uh, you can go online to get our seed guide. If you, We have some paper seed guides back there at our booth, but CropLan, C-R-O-P-L-A-N, genetics.com. You can log on that anytime and uh, pull up the West Seed Guide. And it's going to give you information as to uh, fertility recommendations, different chemistries that are available for the different products. Um, it gives different ratings as far as uh, response to population, response to nitrogen, uh, response to sandy soils, your disease tolerance. So, you know, our company, like everybody else, we've got good resources out there. So when you're, if you're looking at picking a variety of canola, take the time to go through our seed guides and see what fits with you. Um, truth check it off of like the U of I trials. And then also talk to the reps. Talk to myself, talk to Kevin Zander on the on the decal varieties because you know sometimes everything doesn't add up the way it should but proof you know bounce out off of us showing here these varieties that we have available i'm going to talk about just for a second the vtx 121 clearfield another variety that is similar to that is the oasis clearfield the oasis we're starting to run out of and those are both brassica juncias and so they are uh they're clearfield technology but they're non-gmo and those are the two that our company has for non-GMO canolas on the spring, spring canola line. Um, typically, they're going to yield a little bit less than the, uh, the Roundup Reddies. And another problem with the Juncia line is uh, your weed control in Juncia lines, you've got great grass control. There's a slew of products out there you can work with. But as far as taking out broad leaves, you're kind of hamstrung on it. Uh, response to population, one of the things you can do to increase your... Uh, your lesson, your weed load that's out there is VTX 121 and Oasis are both lines that uh, they're pretty inexpensive as far as the cost of the seed and they respond to a higher seeding rate. Most of the time with the Roundup Reddies across the geography, we're talking four to six pounds, but on the Clearfield lines, seven to nine pounds. Sounds like a lot, but two different things go on there. The plants, it seems to produce a higher yield when you're at the higher seeding rate. Um, and also you've got more competition against the broadleaves. Canola in general, you can put clopyrolid on, stinger, but the Juncea lines, if you put uh, clopyrolid on there to take out your dog fennel or a can of thistle, you're gonna have a higher than not likelihood of the plants turn into rubber and uh, delaying your harvest and cutting your yield. So on the Juncea lines, you know, not just mine, but anybody else that's running a Juncea line, don't recommend the stinger or clopyrolid. On the Roundup Ready line, the, uh, the red one that's highlighted is a new one, 969. I think this was our first year of testing out in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not real sure where that one fits in. It's supposed to be a longer season variety, um, cooler weather conditions, but it, it did not hold up to where the uh, 955 and the 930 yielded. Talking about some of our different varieties, for most of this area, if you're close to the Tri-Cities, if you're in a lower rainfall area, the high class 930 is probably the best choice because of its super high heat rating. It's gonna, it's gonna handle less water Stress, it's going to handle the water stresses. It's going to handle high heat uh, problems. 20 years ago, if canola got to be 90 degrees out there, you're done blooming. Where we're at on this 930 is on my farm. Uh, well, I farm a couple of different locations, high elevation and low elevation. On the lower elevation, we had a uh, three-day stint there where it was around 100 degrees, and the 930 did not stop, did not stop blooming. It lost a bit of its bloom. The next week was about 75 to 80 degrees. It actually started getting its bloom back. And the following week, we had three days that were around 110 degrees. That's when it lost its bloom. Canola, that are, canola these days, it's more of a function of running out of water when the bloom is gonna stop and go away for good versus just the temperature that's out there. Um, 930 also has a, uh, a rating for black leg. It has a certain level of tolerance to it. And to address that black leg issue, one of the most critical things is what, what bothers me in, the, in this convention is we've got people talking about cover crops, tillage radishes, things like that. Anything that is a carrier for black leg, please don't put it out in your field unless it has a fungicide seed treat on it because that is the number one, one, number one way for you to start being the guy that puts black leg in your area. So don't do it. And I had several conversations up on the Camas Prairie with guys last year that were getting ready to put out different uh, cover crops. And it's just naked bin run seed. Well, when you're seeding your wheat out in the field, do you put naked bin run seed out? No, you protect it with a fungicide. So that's just a quick thing on the black leg. The, uh, well, 
computer's not working real good for me today, but this is the 955. 955 is a little bit more of a full season canola, and it did real well in the, the U of I trials. It did real well in the answer plot trials, our trials. It's, uh, it's club root resistance. It's rated for black leg. Um, it's one that you're gonna put closer to the mountains where the 930 is gonna be one that you put in a little bit higher heat situation. The 940, 940 is an older variety of ours. It's pretty heat tolerant, not quite as heat tolerant as the 930. Um, but one nice thing about the, uh, the 940 is it's got great emergence, which makes it great for no-till. The 930 also has great emergence for no-till for no situations. But one thing about the 940 where it is a little bit older genetics, if you're looking at a dry situation, if you're gonna be in a, uh, a dry hot area, 10, 12 inch rainfall, even though this one, uh, this one has a little bit less of a yield, um, top end capability than the 930 or the 955, if you start taking the percentage of yield drop that you're gonna have with it, it's not a bad entry level canola in a dry area because you're gonna be 50 pounds off of one of the best performers, but the price tag on the bag is gonna be about 125 bucks less than what the best performers are. So it's, it's a nice entry level, it's a good no-till canola. Packaging options with the cropland, if you're a big farmer, we've got 1,000 pound bulk bags or we've got 50 pound bags. We have a program on the Roundup Ready Canola. Um, if a grower goes in, he buys 25 to 39 bags, he's gonna get $10 per bag rebate. 40 to 74 is $15 a bag rebate. 75 plus bags, $20 a bag rebate. Coming back, wow, two minutes. Um, talking about the winter canola varieties we have available, pretty excited. We've had uh, the two that we've been running mostly with is the 115W and the 125W. They're Roundup Ready plus their SU residue tolerant. So if you put a finesse or a glean or something like that out there, you don't have to worry about a plant back restriction. It blows right through it. We're releasing four new varieties this year, the 225, the 220, and the 1405, and then a Clearfield variety. 115 has been our standard on the, uh, the cold tolerance. That's one we primarily use in the Okanagan. Three out of the four of these varieties that we're releasing, um, everything except for the 1405, has a higher um, cold tolerance than what the old 115 did. On the, uh, the hybrid lines, the 1405 is gonna give you a higher top end yield. It's gonna be a good one for, uh, for irrigation and it's gonna carry a better, uh, better cold tolerance than our old uh, 154W that we use for irrigation. Pretty much with that, I'm gonna say thank you. And where can, one other thing, marketing. Look outside your box. If you're looking at getting into canola, you call your local elevator and you're trying to determine what the price is, a lot of elevators don't wanna take canola. And so they're assessing a three or four cent handle. That wasn't such a bad deal when canola was 31 cents. But now that canola is into the upper teens, mid to upper teens, three or four cents on that is a lot. And you do the simple math on that. If you've got an elevator and they wanna assess a three cent handle, you, there's, there's a lot of resources out there online that you can look up prices. Ag Ventures Northwest has a price. Um, yeah, Ag Ventures Northwest has a price. It's right there by the crusher. Whether you're going to market it with Ag Ventures Northwest or not, there are several other elevators that will offer a price pretty similar to that one. And it's gonna be three cents higher than a lot of the other country elevators that are out there. You do the math on a 70,000 pound load in a truck at your country elevator, three cents is 2,100 bucks. I think you can afford to haul it 100 miles for that if you have to. So look outside the box. Ag Ventures Northwest has a great price. Palmer Green Growers has a great price. Several others do. Um, where can we find the cropland canolas? Any co-op. So we, we give the uh, co-ops the first dibs on our canola lines. And so any co-op you might work with has the uh, first dibs on it. But these co-ops will also cross sell over to the non-co-ops. So if you're interested in a cropland canola, just visit with your regular dealer and see if they can get it for you. And if they don't think that they can get it for you, figure out how to get a hold of me. My phone number is on here. 843-7334 and my email address is bpblatchley at landolakes.com and I can set you up with the dealer. We can get this, we have the product. Quick synopsis, that's what I've got. Thank you guys. Take a question or two. Yeah, we can take a question or two, anybody's got any? 
I agree, Jack. Jack. Jack brought up the point that down in southern Idaho, it looks like we have a pretty big canola potential market down there, primarily with the spring canola. And I have a couple of growers down there in southern Idaho at high elevations, uh, low rainfall that we had our high class 930 out with and a little bit of 955. And I think they're relatively happy. When I say relatively happy, they, uh, they didn't get much rain until way too late, which was the first part of September, which was well beyond the end game. But I think they're going to try it again. And we do have a little bit of uh, winter canola that's out in that southern Idaho area, too. So we are trying to expand the acres that way. Yeah. Right. Right. They could grow canola in their, well, the irrigated guys could grow canola in their, uh, their non-irrigated corners this year, the way the things are looking as far as, and we did have a couple of guys that took some down there to plant winter canola in those waste areas. So we'll see how that pans out. Um, and our uh, next rep is from Monsanto, uh, Kevin Zander. Well, if I can have the lights, this is my favorite kind of presentation, no slides. I've been doing this for about 35 years, and when I can use no slides and be quick about it, that's a good thing. Um, even ask the, some of the people that work with me, right, guys? So um, uh, anyway, uh, Jim said I'm with Monsanto. Uh, we do a lot of uh, corn, uh, primarily up here, alfalfa, uh, canola, and a little bit of soybean. Um, I'm the seed guy for Washington, Oregon. Northern Idaho. Um, I was asked to talk about what's coming down the, the pipeline more or less. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, so we've got traits and non-traits that we're working on. We, we've got collaboration with Bear on, on a lot of things such as the, the Liberty, the uh, uh, shatter resistance, the um, uh, clubfoot, because I, I just heard that from our tech guys that we're, we're working on those those added traits, but as far as biotech traits go, when you look at the, what's coming down, what's probably the nearest and closest is what they call TruFlex. It's the same gene that we have, the same event, the Roundup Ready event that we have in corn, soybeans today. Currently, we have the, the first event in canola. So we're trying to move to that second event in, uh, we're trying to move to that second event in canola. Make some huge differences. It's gonna add about 24 new weed species that you can control to the label. Um, it's gonna increase the flexibility in the application window. Right now, you know, you're pretty much limited to emergence to pre-bolt, to pre um, and you gotta get her done. If you don't, you know, you can see some transient yellowing, that kind of thing, you wanna try to avoid that. But with the, with the TruFlex, the Roundup Ready 2 gene, um, that'll eliminate that, because I, I saw us do that in corn. We went from the first gene to the second gene incredible difference. I have never seen, since we came out with that trait, I've never seen any, anything, any issues on corn at all from that trait. So I think it has the opportunity to increase the application window, control more weeds, and hopefully potentially increase some of the yields in spring and winter canola. So it's going in, into both of them. We're in a, what they call a phase four launch. We have four phases. Um, and the four, phase four is the closest to commercialization. We actually have the trait, we, we've got it, it's good to go. We won't commercialize until we approve, ex, we, we get a export approval from the key countries, China being one of them. So that may delay this a little bit, but who knows when that'll happen, but it's on the table, it's coming. The next phase four piece that we have is Liberty Link canola. So we're gonna put the Liberty Link also into canola as a standalone in the decal varieties primarily for areas that have weed resistance issues popping up with Roundup. So that's in a phase four launch two. Um, what's coming down a little bit further is uh, the True Flex and the Liberty Link, the same trait package in, in together, lumped together. So it'll be in one uh, package in the canola varieties. That's in a phase three development, so a little bit further out. And then the last one that really kind of gets me excited about canola is the dicamba tolerance. Um, that's in a phase two. So you're looking at being able to have a Roundup Ready, Liberty Link, and a dicamba tolerant canola plant here. I don't like to make any dates. I don't like to say dates because usually I'm wrong. But um, I'll give you an example of TruFlex. We expect probably a 16, 17 release, and that's a phase four. And this, this one happens to be in a phase two. So we're probably looking at four, three, four years. I don't know, anybody help me on that, that that's been in more into the canola business than I am. 
I'm sorry? Probably, Probably longer. Yeah, usually that's the case. But the good thing is it's coming. Um, all of our canola varieties today, to date, are hybrids. We've gone away from the OPs. Um, I think most of your, your varieties, uh, thanks to Jim's work, uh, U of I, Jim and Jack's, um, we get a, that's primarily the database I look for. If you look on, the, you look at their results, they're third party, they're non-biased, you don't have to hear it from the salesman on what these yielded and how they performed. Um, I think we have some very competitive varieties. If you look at that data, Jim's data out of uh, U of I there, in a lot of different locations in the Pacific Northwest from dry, hot, irrigated to high elevation uh, uh, dry land. So I think you can see how these products are performing. We have several offerings. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. I have a decent supply. I talked to our guy in North Dakota this morning uh, where the canola business really for Monsanto and Decalb is. And he said that um, supply on a couple of the spring varieties a little bit tight. The one, one they like is a 7007, which is our longest season spring variety. And why they like it is because they have a longer, cooler season for it to finish up in that north central North Dakota. You go down to the southwestern part of North Dakota where they've been using it as a recrop or rotation, kind of like we're trying to do out here. Um, they, they favor the 3042, which is a little earlier variety which gets you out of the woods a little earlier when you start getting too hot, too dry, too fast. You know, it was always my years ago when somebody asked, well, how come we don't grow canola over here in Walla Walla? I said, well, you know, great. You got a lot of good things going on over here, but, you know, it gets too hot, too dry, too fast. I mean, it looks great, blooms wonderful. Then you get that week at the end of May where it gets to 95 to 105 degrees for a week, and bam, you go from 2,500-pound canola to 800-pound canola. And then, you know, so it... It's kind of a, a crapshoot. I think you get up into the Camas Prairie and up north, and you can make these things work a lot better. Um, we have some, we do have good varieties. They're very competitive. All of ours are Roundup ready. We have nothing, no offerings of conventional canola or, or anything like that. We are working on uh, some of the, in collaboration with Bear on some of the, the maybe non-biotech traits. I think there's some talk about Clearfield coming in spring canola. Um, there's some shatter tolerance that we're working on right now, first of all in winter canola varieties because they are more prone to it. Um, we do breeding on both winter and spring canola. We had winter canola, we had both offerings up in the Pacific Northwest until about two or three years ago. We pulled out of the winter canola business in the Pacific Northwest. And it was purely a logistics issue. Um, we have some decent varieties that have some decent winter tolerance. Is it as good as it should be or could be? My opinion, not, we're not quite there yet, but um, they did work um, in some of the areas. So whether we'll be back in the winter canola business uh, remains to be seen. I think it depends on the acres because uh, it's just, like I say, the only reason we pulled out it was logistics because we still sell it in Oklahoma and in uh, you know, Kansas and that northern part of Texas. We've still got a big, pretty decent sized market down there. Uh, they relegated me to, uh, to spring canola varieties up here. I've got two of them that I have a pretty good supply of that have been working pretty well here. Um, both fairly on the short side. I try to stay short, but not quite as short as they're growing in Montana. So I'm kind of finding the sweet spot on the, uh, on the short side of middle of the road, let's put it that way. So we'll be testing them. We'll try to get them to gym again so you can get them in the trials. We have a new one coming, a short one that probably will be replacing uh, the 3042. Uh, that looks real promising because uh, the 3042 is getting a little long in the tooth. We're probably going to move out of that one. As far as where you can access um, the spring canolas, any of, the, uh, any of your seed dealers, your, your Wilbur Ellis's, your CHS's, your um, CPS's, um, various co-ops uh, across the Pacific Northwest, most of them know who I am. I've been around long enough, so if you need something, um, please don't hesitate to ask or just ask some of the dealers in, in your local area, the McGregor's up on the prairie, uh, probably m one of my uh, leading sources for spring canola. In fact, they are the lead in the area. So with that, any questions? Um, our next speaker will be Brian Vincent from uh, Rubisco Seeds, a company based in Kentucky. Uh, Brian is an agronomist in Oklahoma who came up for the meetings here. 
on kind of short notice, I understand, so we appreciate you being here. If I give you too many y'alls or anything like that, somebody just hold up their hand, stop me, okay? <laughs> I've worked with canola down in, in the Southern Plains for about 10 years, and we ran into so many weed issues with uh, some of the Roundup Ready, we were having to tank mix, and it, it taught me that we had to go use some other chemistries anyway. And uh, I sought out DL through Rubisco Seeds as an alternative for my customers that we could use alternate herbicides and rotate out of the Roundup Readies and give us another option there. Um, we have grass herbis grasses in my area that Roundup doesn't touch. No effect. And so we had to move on past Roundup and that's what brought me to, the, to Rubisco. And uh, DL is two German companies that came together and formed DL Seeds. They've been breeding canola for about 150 years, primarily focused on yield. That's pretty good canola but they focus on yield and producing the most pounds. I want to race scale tickets. Uh, their breeding program in, they have a breeding program also up by Winnipeg. I was fortunate enough to visit that location, uh, breeding spring and winter canola in controlled environments and hybrid vigor. Uh, this is some plot averages over 2006, 2007, 2008. The hybrids definitely are the higher producing through those plots. Um, you know, I, I, it's nice to hear that Monsanto's moving out of their OPs. I hope that comes to our area too, you know. Uh, this is some, some local plot data here in the the PNW, uh, Eddie Max is a Clearfield variety that, that Rubisco represents. That's a two gene Clearfield, very promising. Mercedes is one that uh, hasn't been here in the US but about four years, I believe. And um, it, it, it's just blowing the socks off. Um, any place that it, we've put it down in the down in Oklahoma, it, it tops yields. So uh, both of them are, are very winter hardy. They grow a lot of mass. Let's see, this is, this is another plot data. I'm not gonna bore you with that one. Um, here's a, a picture of the hybrid canola next to some open pollinated. And the, the thing that, that we went through some out in the Western Oklahoma, an extremely dry area, very poor soil, um, clay, it's just nasty stuff. It doesn't, it really, honestly, there's no topsoil. It was, we dug a, a pit six feet deep. Um, we had hybrid canola with massive root at six feet. And that was in the, that was pre-bolt in the spring. Um, the foliage you see, the biomass that you see on top is indicative of what's in the ground. It's, it produces a lot of biomass in the soil as well. Uh, I get the question, why is, why is hybrids uh, more expensive? Um, we work with seeding rates, seeds per acre, not pounds per acre. And I'd like to discuss that with you if you want to come by the booth. But uh, the hybrid seeds in this coming out of this breeding program are higher per pound than what, what you'll see through the industry. And it's very explainable. There's some of the varieties taken here in Washington, Oregon research facilities. The Eddie Max Clearfield. Saffron is a, a very consistent, very hardy plant. Uh, does not have the, the high yield, high end yield potential. 
Uh, Inspiration is a, a very aggressive plant. And then we have the Mercedes there that's been the racehorse. On the Eddie Max Clearfield, this is a, a trial that we did with uh, the Beyond and how, how resilient it is to that chemistry. Um, Eddie Max and the ALS herbicides, Eddie Max is very, very tolerant to, to residues. We've been through some very extensive testing. Um, my farm, Brian's plots throughout the U.S., and different soil conditions and extremely high rates of these products to see what, how much can it withstand. The two gene Clearfield tolerant canola versus the SUs. Um, stand establishment is one aspect. You know, we can lose stand, we can see SU in a re SU resistant variety, but uh, that doesn't always go on to yield. Um, I have witnessed SU varieties that had pollination issues and they should not have. But it, w it all went back to, to the SU intolerance throughout the growing season. This is uh, indicative of the emergence and later death on those, those plants. Um, here's some of the varieties and, and how they yield. This would be the saffron. This is, you know, a pretty flat plane. It's, it's just a tough old variety that just hangs around and, and gets it done. But if you have the potential, the other varieties are, are a lot better. Citro is, a, Citro is probably the most prominent in the, in the southern plains for a Rubisco variety. This is a spring canola that we've, we've launched here in the last year or two. The NCC 101S has done extremely well in the plots and uh, it's gonna be in limited seed supply. So if you would be interested in putting some out or keep your eye on it through the plots and the, the university trials and so forth. Uh, DL is, is working on has black leg varieties that they they rate um, there's a lot of things that they there's a lot this they do a lot of breeding to produce more bushels per acre the disease ratings I know I do a lot of those in the southern plains for Rubisco and other companies as well here's the production in the EU average Bushels is 700 bushels, 70 bushels per acre. Um, I've, I've met with Russians that are in very similar climate as it is out here, growing Eddy Max and very consistent high yielding. They, they do cheat a little bit. Uh, apart from, from the seed, uh, we do a lot of conventional herbicide research, fungicide, uh, plant growth regulators along with fertility and and seed planting equipment and what's what's the best way to establish the crop it's a conventional herbicide research trial um, using some pre-emerges efficacy I know there's the using different herbicides at different rates and testing things that pursuing IR4 labeling so we can use them on conventional varieties and traded varieties. With that, I'll ask for any questions. I see the same thing in the Southern Plains. Sometimes we actually achieve a harvestable stand at a lower seeding rate than those that plant the higher rates and have significant, you know, as much as 80, 90% winter kill 
to, to have a harvest rate. You know, planting a good quality seed that, you know, and most of these hybrid seeds are sized, we're sending out the large, more viable seed, and you can get that seeding rate down and, and have survivable plants, harvestable plants. I want to harvest 80 or 90 percent of the plant seeds I drop, not kill them off. So with that. All right. Uh, thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, we're going to finish up um, this morning with uh, Jim Johnson from Star Specialty Seed. I, I've known Jim for a lot of years. Uh, he's been in the canola business for a long time, and so I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Jim. I stand between you and lunch, so I'll try to, get, try to wrap it up as fast as I can. But uh, certainly a pleasure to be out here. Um, I know uh, I, my career started about 25 years ago, and I think that even precedes Jack Brown at the university, so I know it's been a while. But it's a pleasure being out here. I lived in Idaho Falls for a number of years, so I love this country out here. Um, we started Star Specialty Seed in 2012, and uh, it's, really a, it's really been a kind of a fun project. Um, let's see, where's your arrow? There we go. Um, so I, I, I worked with a, with a group of investors um, back about 10 years ago. We had a vision of building a crushing plant, and we were able to build one in northern, northern Minnesota. And once we got that plant built, we saw a need for, for really some guys that really wanted to focus on canola. So I would call us canola experts. We really passionately want to see the canola industry grow. We do see a lot of potential for the industry yet. I know there's challenges. Everywhere we go, we see challenges, but yet I think there's, there's got to be a little more focus on just fixing some of the things that are fixable yet with the crop. It has enormous potential. So um, with that, we got the plant going in uh, 2012. And one of the things that we tried to do is um, we, we, we looked at some oil content data over a number of years. We saw a real opportunity. There's a premium contract that we offer back, back east, and I think it's something the industry could really pick up on because uh, the crushing plants need to, be, uh, need to be healthy and viable as well, and we're seeing a very big, big need for that. So um, the other thing is I've worked with a lot of the larger companies, and you know, as much as we really want to see all the crops sur survive, a lot of focus in the larger companies has been on corn. No fault to them. That's where the money's at. You can understand it, but I really, you get a little tired of, you know, well, t no resources to do these orphan crops like canola. So that's what kind of led my passion to get out and try some of these different things. Um, the first, so we, we work with winter canola, spring canola, and then a couple of the other areas, biologicals and things like that. But Star 402 was a, was a variety. We, we do have a current, we're a cu current holder of a Monsanto technology license. This is our first hybrid, and we write a premium contract on this spring variety back in, uh, back in North Dakota, Minnesota. And it's, it's had very good performance. It's been in the trials a few years with, uh, with Jim and Jack, and we've been really pleased. I think it fits extremely well. In, uh, and certainly on the Camas Prairie and some of the some of the other areas out here, and so we'd like to we tried a small amount out in this area last year had good performance, and so we think we can certainly do something with that. We'd call it early mid in maturity, um, certainly not tall for plant height and has an excellent lodging score. We have been doing some direct harvest work with that variety back um, back east as well, and I uh, think it has a lot of potential in that area. So uh, I wouldn't call it a, a genetic trait for toler shatter tolerance, but certainly a, a bit better. We think it has a very high pod density, and that's kind of what makes it um, it kind of kind of you know um, uh, hold together during some of those windier windier events. So we've we've seen it a good candidate for direct harvest. Our winter variety, um, certainly another. We just tried a very small amount of, of Star 915W up this, this way last year. Um, we're going to continue to explore that uh, come this fall. Um, it is a CERT, so it's an SU Roundup um, variety. Um, we, we think it does have some potential. Um, this was mainly developed for that, for that Kansas, Oklahoma market. So um, we'll, we'll see how it works up here. Um, it's certainly in the trials again this year. And we do have a couple other candidate hybrids that we're actually looking for uh, to round out that, that winter canola um, market. So we think that could be another, mother, another area where, where we're quite interested. The one thing that we did have liked about, about 915W, um, it does have a pretty tight crown position, so it does hold to the ground for pretty well. Some of your more vigorous uh, hybrid type, type um, varieties tend to get that growing point or that crown just up 
a little bit more exposed. And so I think that's one of the things that we want to look for when we get um, winter varieties is keep that crown position ni nice and tight to that soil so it can, can, so it can stay and not be exposed to those, those really cold temperatures. Um, one of the areas that about four or five years ago we started to become interested in biologicals and you know there's a lot of products out there. Uh, we've certainly heard um, talks even here about that we're not really seeing a difference. Um, I'm in the camp that the devil's in the detail and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things to work out here. And so I'm not in, in the camp that says it's the best, the best thing since sliced bread. But we have come across a product that um, we've got an area in the southwestern part of North Dakota that this product's been working pretty good. It's called Yield Plus from a company called Excite Bio out of Manitoba. And spent a lot of time looking at where it works, why it works, how it works. And we have seen quite a, quite a bit of interest. It's, uh, it's foliar applied as a liquid and it's a plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. So a um, little different than some of the other things out there. And um, it goes on with that early herbicide application, so pretty efficient for the grower. And we've seen some, some nice yields uh, up to, you know, around that, I'd say 8 to 11 is pretty common. Have seen a couple cases where we've shot 19%, but um, it's not all that visual sometimes. For the first time, we've actually got some out in, in winter canola down in uh, the Kansas, Oklahoma area, so we're looking at th this product as well down there. Um, it's not, it's an na all natural product, so you've, you, it could certainly be used in, in a, in a non-GMO uh, market as well. Um, we're looking for some, some interest in trying it. I mean, right now, uh, we haven't got much of it out yet here in the in Pacific Northwest, but I think it does hold enough interest to, um, to certainly give it a try. And so that's another area that I think has potential for the future. The final area that I think has a lot of, lot of room to do yet, um, certainly, Certainly we just had a tip of it um, just, just in the last presentation, but um, row spacing, fertility, I think there's a lot of work that we could really improve the crop if we can master both of these at the same time. I don't think it's a, a zero sum game where it's one or the other, but we've done quite a bit of work with, um, with both split applied nitrogen and wider row spacings. This was one of the trials we did last year in, in, in North Dakota, and we did 16 inch rows versus eight inch rows. Uh, the 16 inch rows were three pound seeding rates, uh, spring canola versus six pound seeding rate, which is, tends, tends to be quite high. Well, at first glance, three pounds seems like a low rate, but we had a lot of plants in those rows, albeit they're 16 inches. And, and what got really interesting is when we, when we threw the fertility at it, um, the highest yielding treatment in that trial was the full rate, pre, all pre-plant incorporated at three pounds per acre versus six pounds. So, uh, if you can see on the left, we do have a little taller. That's the that's the wide rows, and that and, and it was um, it was that's three pound seeding rate. So it's about I'd say six, eight, ten inches taller than the narrower rows, six pounds, and we did get pretty high yields there. So that that really got me to thinking. A um, lot of work being done on on the precision planting, and on and certainly the corn the corn planter. Um, taking that those um, those plates to try to the 90 cell plate looks like it's pretty good. I mean, we mentioned monosin was already mentioned, and I'm you know obviously that one will work. But I think I think we can get a lot of makes and models of planting equipment, and we've got we've in the last five six years there's been a lot of investment into new planting equipment, and can all I believe that that can really work. We can get those rates down. Uh, we can I know the crop is deemed as an expensive crop, but I think the combination of fertility and row spacing, um, we got to get some better, better planting techniques. The, um, the old air seeder, um, you can throw more seed on, but I think we really want to do a better job of getting that thing placed, get some pressure over that row so that we can get it to all merge evenly, uh, emerge out of the ground evenly. So with that, um, I'll take some, I guess I've got a couple things I'm looking at for future products. I want to continue to hit on high oil, even though you're not offered a premium out in this market yet. I think it's just good for the industry. There's a lot of room genetically. Um, there's a lot of variation out there. I think one of the reasons why we haven't seen that come on as fast as we could have in Canada is that the registration system is kind of like it's a must system where you must have a, a, you know, a protein level, an oil content, disease rating, all these must, must be better than the mean of the checks for the variety to get registered. So from a plant breeding community standpoint, they're probably putting some of the best oil material in the shelf just because they want to meet the must requirements for all those other characteristics at the same time. So 
you know, oil kind of gets left with the side, but make no mistake about it. This industry, we're about oil. Can all oil is what's valuable. So that's something we're going to have to look at. Of course, shattering tolerance has been mentioned. I also think that's very important. I think it can be managed. Um, we believe that the high oleic trade is also really, really a nice trait for the future. And so that's uh, both winter and springs, I think, can be, can be good. So further work on the biologicals can also be, I think, kind of, kind of valuable to the crop. So with that, I'd take questions. Um, if you know of anybody out there that would like to try a trial on that yield plus, I'd be interested in working with some guys. So with that, if there's any questions? Yes. Okay. The question was, what's the relationship between protein and oil? Certainly there's a correlation there. Um, I wouldn't call it a, a complete uh, negative correlation where you're We've made, we've been able, as an industry, uh, there's been a lot of progress made with both, both protein and oil. Uh, one of the things I think you see with, with, as we get higher oil, generally we see a lighter colored, seed is generally brown to black, and as you get higher oil varieties, you tend to see a lot more yellow seeded in there, tans, um, not so much on the dark end. And so that, artificially, you're increasing oil content right there, less fiber in there. And so that would be the other question is you get to those higher oil contents, I'd be interested to see what their fiber content is. And, and you know, it, I wouldn't just matter of factly say, okay, you got high oil, you're going to have low protein. I don't think that's... Yeah, we also yeah I mean, the, we, oil is accumulated last. And so when you think about, you know, as, as you reach physiological maturity, the oil is laid down last. And so if you, if you cut that crop too early or if you we're all, um, you know, if you're going to swath it, if you're going to direct harvest it, and you, you know, generally, the, the longer you can wait, if those seeds are black as the ace of spades, generally you've done everything you can. If you see a red or scarlet brown um, a seed lot, that a red colored seed lot indicates it went through stress, generally heat stress. Yeah. 